Hi, we're here with Greg Wells from Adele to Katy Perry to Dua Lipa to Kelly Clarkson to Deftones to Rufus Wainwright, and that's not even bringing up all the movie soundtracks. Greatest Showman, Tick, Tick, Boom, Wicked, on and on and on. Welcome, Greg Wells. Thanks, but for being here. It's an honor to be asked by you to, to oh, be here. This is this is. is this is really great to, to have you here and talk about some of the stuff we've done together. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm a fan of yours. Some of the records that you've made are are now my benchmarks. So I really want to talk about those things. I'm a big Deftones fan. Rufus we did together. 21 Pilots we did not do together, but I love those records. I love their aesthetic. I, I love the quirkiness and the out of control nature of those two. And I'd love to talk about Run and Go because I think that's one of the tracks you did, right? Mm -hmm. um, assuming you remember. Um, I, I, I love the sort of theatricality of it, the, 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 the fact that it just goes off into this other bridge and comes back to just a, a sort of a chorus that happened earlier in the tune, but it's not quite. It's just brilliant. It's really orchestral. And for those guys who are kind of emo punk rockers, I thought that was such a stretch. It was brilliant. They are amazing. I felt super fortunate to cross paths with them. Um, and that was at a point, you know, in their career where they, they hadn't even really kind of upstream to Atlantic at that point. They were wow, signed to Fueled by Ramen, which was under the umbrella of Atlantic. But I don't know that anyone realized what was going to happen with them, you know. Um, but I'd seen footage of their live concerts, and I met with them, and we just clicked. Nice. Um, and you know, Tyler in particular, who's writing all of that stuff, and uh, he's just you know he's like a mastermind guy, and so he would bring his Logic demos to me on his laptop, which were great. And I always feel like I, I think there's a world of of, of producers who feel like they need to cut everything from scratch again, you know, e regardless of how great or bad the demo is. If you have access to the demo tracks, they don't want to do it. Cause, and there's, there's legal reasons why that's actually a good idea, because it can be messy and you wind up bringing in... It's kind of like asking a camel to enter the tent when you start using other people's masters, <laughs> right? It, gets, it becomes this whole other yes. thing. Yeah. But creatively, which is the only thing I care about, yeah. If they get it right on the demo, I don't care that I wasn't involved. Who, who cares? The essence of the song is there. Done. At least build from it, you know? Totally. Maybe you're keeping just the core track. I, I really think, like, in a lot of people's demos, that magic, that essence, you know how it is. The first time you record a song, that's when all the magic is there. And yeah. every time you copy it, it's like a facsimile. Some of the energy just gets lost. So I always, if somebody's got good demos that have personality sounds, quirky sounds, I'm almost like, keep that. Okay, the tempo is going to be a little different. Let me see if we can bump it up, or compress it, whatever it is. And some of that magic is in that initial recording. And I hate re-recording stuff where you potentially lose that. So it's great to hear that you kept some elements of their demo. I mean, I, I have to. I feel like it's so hard to, to get anything to come through the, these emotionless speakers that move us, right? It's so hard to make a great record because we have no visual, we have no energy exchange from performer to audience. We only have this. And for me, music is a way bigger thing than just the sound of it. So... If it's coming off a demo, I feel like we got, we'd be foolish to not use it. You know, I actually I learned a lesson um, really the hard way, but I've never forgotten it. So I'll try and keep this quick. But like in 1994, I had some very ego based dreams of wanting to be like a you know like in a rock band. I had my own like rock band. So I actually got a little indie record deal on the last legs of IRS. Records I remember this. Yes, with Miles Copeland. Yep. And so he, I did some demos on a on a eight track cassette machine that I had in a in a the apartment I was living in, 
and I rented a drum room on Vineland in the Valley, and I was sharing with two other drummers, and I, I brought like a couple mics, one was a Radio Shack, like a realistic PZM mic, or, and just recorded like some simple drum tracks, and I'd bring it back to that studio, and I'd play guitar and try to sing, I'm not a good singer, but like the first songs I ever wrote, those were the demos that led to that little deal. The demos had a vibe, even if they weren't the best songs in the world, and I'm clearly not a great singer, but that led to the record deal, and so I thought, okay, well, now we have like a little bit of a budget. We had a small budget, but it was enough to go to Rumbo Recorders for three weeks. And I remember Miles Copeland, who's a brilliant guy Absolutely. and full of great ideas. Yes. But I do remember him saying, I just want you to re-record these demos and just make it sound like a record because these demos don't sound like a record. And he was right. They sounded small sonically. Mm -hmm. It was done on like a little Mackie console. I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. Um, but I knew how to play, so that had a vibe of like it was played with an attitude. So anyway, we did that. We were in rum Rumbo. I had a great time. I thought it was great. It sounded better to me. The record company went bankrupt, not because of me, <laughs> but because of a Peter Frampton record that they'd done. It was called Come Alive 13 or something. Oh, I don't know. right. And they sent hundreds of thousands of copies out and thinking it was going to be huge and for some reason it wasn't they all got returned it killed the record company because right, this would have been 20 30 years after Frampton comes alive someone thought it was a good idea yeah, no. and it, it, it wound up being the thing that ended the record company so my record never came out but i remember playing it for somebody a good friend of mine actually from canada and she said you know what your demos are better I'm like what no they're not what are you talking about she said i know it doesn't you, this sounds better sonically but the vibe on the demos are better and I was sitting with Stuart Copeland, Miles' younger brother, telling him this little story. And he's like, Greg, of course. He's like, there's a massive difference between creating and recreating. Yeah. They're right. not the same thing. And I've never, I'll never forget him looking at me, who's one of my drum idols. I wanted to course, be Stuart when I was a teenager, yeah. you know. Yep. That's it. So I've, since that time, anytime I got a spare five bucks, I would invest it into something where I could like Tyler was doing with his computer, because the technology at that point was so good, right. you can, it can become your master's. Yep. And do you remember what uh, that particular song came from the demo? Was that your piano that's at the core of it? It was different every time. There were lots of things from his Logic demo that uh -huh. were just stock Logic sounds, but because he's such a great musician and such a great composer, we, we would either keep it or we would use it as like, well, this is the benchmark. If we can't beat this, yep. we have it. And it feels right. So sometimes the bass sounds would be from his Logic demo. Sometimes I was able to beat it. And, and we would know between Josh, Tyler, and me, we would know if yeah. we felt like, okay, this is better. And if it's not, we'll just keep it. Um, I, you know, one thing I, 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 I actually really regret is I produced that record for a very low fee. I don't regret that at all at all but the person managing me at the time who will go nameless who was a good manager but they said uh, if they asked to share production credit you shouldn't do that because you took such a low fee and at the end of the process Tyler did come to me and say is it okay if I have you know you put your name first Greg but like can we share and I was like uh, yeah that always feels awkward I, I know. normally I don't mind yeah but I said no, and I feel like that was a mistake because it really, like his his work is all over that record, you know, especially when we're pulling from his original masters. It was kind of a another lesson hard learned, you know. It's like the money just doesn't matter at the no, end of the thing. No. It's all about like how does this sound in twenty years from exactly. now? Exactly. The relationship, you know. I have never worked with them since. Got to play that, a long game. Is that partly yeah. why? Probably. Is that possibly entirely why? Maybe. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I'm so friendly with them, but. Um, yeah, it's like every time I walk through the studio door, it's always like, oh, I could do that better. Yeah. You know, if it's a tiny little thing or a like huge thing like that. But anyway, I'm a huge fan of recognizing, do we have a little piece of gold in front of us? Right. Oh, I don't care who came up with it. We, we'd be nuts to not incorporate that, yeah. that gold. Build upon it. Yeah. Totally. Definitely. And um, the whole sort of, uh, I seem to remember, I mean, it goes off in that kind of, queen sort of dramatic place was that something that was built into his demo or is that something you guys came up with in the studio without question it was built into the roadmap that he walked wow. in with yeah amazing and i'm such a a, a a drama 
queen that I love. I love feeling like I'm on a music roller coaster. Yes, and really, that song does. So they were sort of a dream act for me to work with because it's all about... So I hate seeing the joke coming. You know? Good point. I, I hate it when you can see the punchline coming. You sort of know what it is. I love being sucker punched by it. And I like art that way, too. I, yes. I like art that's full of surprise. And um, So it was really... I just I definitely like just kind of ramped up what they gave me. But their cool. script, Tyler's script was so tight and the ending to just change keys i can't even remember now the the whole end where it kind of comes out of that giant bridge and then goes to this sort of crazy chorus that was all in his framework it was yeah wow yeah oh yeah amazing he's brilliant yeah he's brilliant he's really really brilliant he's again it's part of my regret of like not i think he should have been recognized for the production as well and even now was that done with ian mcgregor it was yeah uh because the drum sounds are great. I, I, I mean, to me, like, I love, you know, we've worked together on so many things. I, I love those tight, dead drum sounds where you really feel like you're in the room or maybe in the closet right. with the drummer. Yeah. And those are just great sounds. They're just punchy enough. They sit underneath the piano in a, a really nice way. And mm-hmm. I know you and Ian like came up with this whole other miking technique where you put mics underneath cymbals as opposed to on top. And it, You know, the drum sound at my old studio at Rocket Carousel was very much a hybrid combo of things that I have learned from you over the many times we've worked together and I continue to learn from you every time we work together. Um, uh, Eric Valentine became uh, a friend of mine. I wound up being his first uh, client to buy one of his consoles. Mm. So we started sharing a lot of information and and Eric does this whole thing. He calls it, um, instead of overheads, he calls it underheads. And... um, uh, it's about rejection and like a figure eight pattern and so you could just you know you eliminate toms and you, and you have symbols and they're not quite as harsh as the overheads and sometimes you want that harsh thing in the overheads sure sometimes you don't um also the sound of those drums is really the drums and it was in this room here working with you where the great drummer matt chamberlain said greg there's a drum kit for sale from don bennett up in seattle right and it's a 1940 radio king slingerland kit is that what you had radio kings i didn't know that for wow, years. Those that are was, always amazing sounding kits. Those are the drums on the 21 Pilots Vessel album. Wow. It's a 1940, it's an old big band kit. Yeah. Like Gene Krupa, Louis Belson. Like 26 kick or? 26 kick. Uh-huh. Huge kick drum. Yeah. Which just sounded like a great sounding kick drum. It didn't really sound massive and bonhomie to me. It just sounded like great. And the drums, they sort of sound like like how I imagine Barney Rubble from the Flint- Flintstones sounding if he was, you know, and I think there's an episode where he does drum. Yes, he does. He's like a jazz drummer, but they sound like caveman drums to me, and I really love that. I love that sound, yeah. It's just boxy, and it does feel like you're rolling rocks down the down it's bedrock. Like you're in Joshua Tree, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like if Joshua Tree had a sound, that's sort of what that, <laughs> that drum kit was. And so uh, we had, a, you know, we experimented with a lot of stuff, miking those drums, and it, but the source was so great it's always the way always like that kick way. drum i remember when it came out of the the case it just <laughs> sounded great amazing it sounded really amazing. incredible yeah. um and josh was a really fun drummer to record too he was really great up energy. for it yeah. fantastic energy he yeah. would we were also excited to work on this music and we all kind of felt this like this is the moment you know not knowing what the future would be um, and he was sort of indefatigable he could just go out and like do take after take after take he hit really hard wow and he would come in and he'd get really excited by the drum sounds. And the more I kind of ch- chased it with Ian, the more excited he would get. And um, it was like the ceiling becomes your floor and that ceiling becomes your floor. And exactly, we going exactly. And going and going yeah. that, No, that's great when you have that with an artist where you push each other. And that's why I love us working together because we, we're always just throwing ideas back and forth at each other. And in, in the end, the record gets better. And everybody's like, yeah, this was like so worth it you know totally. where we walked in the room today it felt good nothing wrong with it but where we ended up is amazing that's why i'm hesitant to do a lot of pre-production and some of my favorite people do a lot of pre-production but for me i feel like you just never know what's going to happen when you show up in the room whatever it is whether it's somebody's garage or whether it's a amazing studio like this you just don't know how one tiny little thing will inform 
maybe nothing or maybe everything or maybe some part of it. And I like being nimble. I like being able to pivot and, uh, you know, so I remember like a huge part of the sound of Vessel is that drum kit, which, you know, the sound of the drums changes everything. And of course, the songs are great, and yeah. they're great. And Tyler's a great performer, he's a great singer, and he gives you this crazy manic energy, and he gives you the tiny sensitive energy, and he gives you everything you want. He's a great artist, but I remember the cool thing that was one of the first records I mixed on that undertone oh, audio that console. Was on Eric's console. It was wow. on Eric's console. Might be the first album I mixed on it. Wow. And I asked Eric to, to give me two mix buses on it. And so my approach at the time was. Um, the middle section was a bunch of like mix bus gear, analog gear, and I would put that on mix bus one, which for me was the music, the band bus. Uh -huh. Mix bus two was inside the thing, and it was just a clear path straight to the master, the tube, vacuum tube master output of the console. Oh. And I would crank the Shadow Hills mastering compressor on the band. And I was really into this unit at the time, the SPL, um, what's it called? Transient... Oh, Vi trans Transient Designer? Yeah. Or no, it's the Vitalizer. Oh, the Vitalizer, I the, yeah. I love it's the like a harmonic design. generator kind of thing. It's a weird thing. It's yes. like kind of an exciter, but also it's this weird like bass thing, and you can compress the bass frequencies. And I, I just kept like, playing with all that, and I got the band to this really kind of like juiced up state, and then his vocals would bypass all of that. And then it would feed into Pro Tools, and I do a little bit more to the mix right. bus there. But that approach really affected the drums as wow. well. Yeah, because the thing I loved about that record and the, the the piano sound and the drum sound is it had this thick kind of lower mid range, and that's always hard to get because you know the tendency is always to clean that stuff out. And right. when you clean that stuff out, yeah, everything's nice and clear and has a home. But some of the soul some of the power really gets lost and the thing i remember about that is it just had this thickness but never felt muddy or murky or congested it just had this way of just kind of roaring through in those frequencies and that's so tough to get i have to also give a little credit more than a little credit to howie weinberg who mastered the that best record. the best like mr vibe and, and I remember something he did that really affected exactly what you're complimenting the record uh, uh, regarding. Um, he took out a little tip-top high-end. He rolled it off. Wow. Like tape will do. That's not what mastering engineers usually do. And how cool is it that he, and he told me he was doing it. He said, I'm actually going to reduce some of the real like 18K and up. Like I'm going to roll it off. And I thought, really? Because I love all that detail. Me too. And he said, yeah, I said, I think it sounds cool. He's like, I'll send it to you. Tell me what you think. And it did that. It changed the focus to yes. more of a low mid roar, is it, right. exactly as you just said. And I loved it. I love, he just really helped push it a little further into whatever I was trying to do. He really helped kind of focus it. And I love what he did. Howie that. is such an intuitive mastering engineer, you oh, know. Yeah. He, he is all feel uh, recently he did a band uh, for me that was kind of um, a modern take on Motley Crue wow. where it had that sort of 80s energy but it had a alternative more modern feel to the groove and the bass lines mm -hmm. how he just had this way of like capturing that spirit that energy but without it sounding processed because you know how all those records then were super high gain guitars yeah. and everything was really edgy and kind of your your initial reaction to the records were like wow but 20 seconds later you'd just be this hurts <laughs> and, and he had this way of just taking these mixes and keeping that roar, that energy, mm. but it never had that harshness. Now, Howie's pretty pretty special. He's an amazing record maker. He's yeah. an amazing guy to link arms with and, yeah. you know, help you kind of be cool. And really good at sandwiches, too. Like, you, you want something, Greg? Yeah, you must be hungry. Let me get you, let me get you some food. Yep. Yeah. There's only one Howie, you know. Uh, I, I, used to, I used to fly to New York all the time to, uh, you know, master with him which i stopped doing because i realized like i don't know the sound of his room he knows it. <laughs> yes 
but hanging with him was always like yeah. the fun, you yeah. know. Like I, we don't need to put this on on uh, video, but I have to tell you one story just because it's really fucking funny. <laughs> You know how he just goes at this shit. You know he really, it, like he really, it is all intuitive. He just kind of tweaks shit. You know. Yeah. So Dennis Herring told me this great story about how he, when he went back to do the Modest Mouse record, he said that how oh, he was just kind of going at it. And, you know, finally had something, and he was like, "Hey, Dennis, come here, come here, come here, I gotta play this because he's got a real New York kind of thing." And um, He's the Barney Rubble of Master. He really is. He looks like him. Yeah, yeah. So he he'd just been so into it and so into tweaking and everything, and you know it's always so loud with him. And yeah. Room. So he calls Dennis over. He says, "Hey, check this out. Check this out." And Dennis listens and he says, "Howie, does it matter to you that only one speaker is working?" <laughs> No, <laughs> like it just wow. it just been like so deep in it that like one side had gone down. That's, oh, I love that. Though. Yeah, but that's Howie. You know, he just like focuses because you know if he would chose to pay attention to that he would immediately. Of know course, of course. Yeah, he's only got one exactly. speaker firing, but that's so like I kind of love that. Yeah, exactly. No, it's brilliant yeah. because you know how deep all of us go in this shit and even you know the the, the classic thing of you're playing with something forever and you're tweaking and tweaking and then you realize oh the EQ is actually not engaged. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Humbling. The humbling moment of yes. turn it on. Stupidity. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Well, you're here <clears throat> We were here together in 2005. The end of 2005. We have to talk about Mika. Sure. Because that's one of the best times we've had together. And, and I think a really great record that we made together. I was so happy to be a part of that. He's such a great artist. Such great energy. Such an amazing singer. And watching the two of you work together... I. I felt like you became this extension of him, even to the point where there were times where he would play something on the piano and he'd kind of get frustrated and say, no, I can't play this. And then you'd go jump in on the piano and you'd morph yourself into him, but just to add a couple of little things. And it was, it was like I was seeing this new form of human being this mm. greg mika thing that just became so impressive to me mm. uh, i loved what that record was the bigness of it the layers we should talk about all those background vocals we should talk about the the uh in grace kelly the uh uh not finger snaps, but the clippity clop sort of noise that's in there. And I just remember you in Pro Tools just layering stuff on and on and on. And then going, and you're really good about this. You're, uh, you're one of my favorite muters. I love how you will put so much stuff on. And then you're really fearless and just go, no, no, no. Okay, keep that. Keep that. I didn't know I did that. Oh, yeah, no, huh. no, uh, and 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 I, I think even when we worked together with Buble, uh, I you kind of do the same thing where you would just put lots of combinations together, and then you're really good about being able to sit back, have the objectivity, which is tough, and just go, okay, even though I played that or some famous musician played that, eh, not quite appropriate right now. Let's move aside. I mean, I think I react to it the same way that we all react if we have a fork and food on the fork and we put it in our mouth and it doesn't taste good. No one needs to think about it more than half a second, right? No one's like five seconds in going, well, yeah, it's not very good, but do I like it? Do I? No, it's like everyone's spitting it out, right? And you're not going to take another fork full. So I, in my own feeble way, I've sort of trained myself to react like a fan to what's coming out of the exactly. speakers. I try to, I try to. That's the one thing I really love about Rick Rubin's approach is that he really, he goes to fan. the greatest lengths to just be a fan with sometimes not even really spending... Checking out of the project to gain the objectivity. Exactly. He wants to sit on his couch at home and react to it like 
if he were listening to the radio and, and didn't know what color shirt the singer was wearing that day or what drama happened in someone's family or whatever. It just wants to hear it. So my approach as a record maker is really different where I'm often sort of like neck deep in the details and sometimes I'm writing the song with the artist or I'm playing the instruments or both and, and, and you can lose objectivity very quickly that way. Uh, but I do try to react. You're right, I don't care who played it. You know, I'll be the first one to go, I'm the wrong element in this thing. Um, the Mika thing was an amazing study in sort of like having no expectation. You know, like we, um, Mika was, Mika is a great artist. He's a brilliant guy. And he was a very hot signing at the time. And there was a bidding war over him and Lucian Grange and Doug Morris did a joint signing where Lucian was still running Universal in Europe. He wasn't running it worldwide at that point. Doug was running it in America. They jointly signed him. Tommy Mottola was involved in the American, right, I remember that. Yeah. The American part of the signing. So it was sort of the three of those guys. It wasn't sort of. It was the three of those guys. I don't know why this didn't work out. And I don't think it's a secret. But Mika was in the studio for three months with one of my heroes, Trevor Horn. The amazing right. record producer, I Trevor Horn. Who yeah. has influenced me so Brilliant. massively. Brilliant. I will never in a million years be ABC, able to. ABC, Look of Love. Classic. Yeah. Of the longest yeah. list. I mean, Frankie goes to Hollywood. Yeah, it goes on and on. And on. Unbelievable. Yeah. Grace Jones, Slave to the Rhythm. Oh, I forgot about that. Yes, 902, whatever that's called. You know, right. just Owner of a Lonely Heart. Um, Trevor's The Buggles. Yeah. Video Killed the Radio Star. That track still blows me away. Yep. That's Trevor's Absolutely. an artist, you know, which actually began his production career because everyone loved that song so and much. And was opened up MTV. It was the first that's video exactly on right. MTV. Total genius. Yes. Clearly, I worship at the altar of Trevor Horn. For some reason, it didn't work out. With with uh, that pairing, didn't work out. And even weirder, uh, I got next in line after Trevor. And I was very young in my producer career. And I think the songwriter Cara Diaguardi had a lot to do huh. with that happening. Fantastic. And she was working a lot with Tommy Mottola at the time, and uh -huh. she just she really went to bat for me. Uh, she's never really admitted that, but I think I've sort of osmosed that information. So Tommy called me, Cole called me at the studio. He's like, I know we've never met, but I think you're the guy to change. Let me, so they flew Mika over here. We had two days booked. It was a weekend. I immediately called you. I said, if you're available and you can do this, I need your help. I don't quite know what's going on. I don't even know what song we're going to do. We don't have a budget to make a record, but we have Tommy Matola said we can hire the engineer, uh, uh, we can hire you, we can hire this room, and we can rent some instruments. So I called Ross Garfield, we rented a drum kit, I called Andy Brower, we rented a bass guitar, an electric guitar, we used the piano that was here. And Mika sat here, right where we're sitting right now, and played some songs from a cassette or a DAT machine. I remember, yes. We listened to a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think we listened to almost 10 songs. And at the end of it, he said, so which one do you want to start with? And I said, well, you know that Grace Kelly song? I really like that. I think that's really fun. We thought, let's let's work on that one. And he's like, really? He said, I've demoed that one six or seven times. It's it's tough. And I said, no, I really liked it. Let's can we dig in on that one? He said, sure. So you and I just hit the ground running. Everything is first or second take. I remember the the drum stuff. I remember going out and getting a sound and quickly and or quick for me is you know two hours but i remember going out getting a sound quickly deadly drum and sound. and i think it was two takes i think you did one take and went okay maybe i'll do one more uh, and that was it and um because the, I didn't know we were even making a record at that point. I yeah. thought we were just sort of like pastiching a demo together. I didn't know what we were doing. I was sort of auditioning as maybe I'm going to produce some of me. Cause, and I was kind of auditioning him. I didn't know if he was crazy or a good guy or both or <laughs> neither. And then a day and a half later... And then I played bass on it. I played, right, I remember you playing the bass. Piano, and I wanted Mika to play piano because I like his piano playing yes, for yes. his music way better than mine. Different. He's got all the vibe for yeah, his music, and I don't have his vibe. I play more accurately, but that's not necessarily more interesting. Of course. But he, at that time, felt better with me playing his part. He felt like it would glue better to the track. So I'm trying to sound like him on piano. I played some guitar. 
I remember we brought Lyle Workman in the yes. second day, and he played some amazing kind of Brian May guitar. I remember that. Uh, the wire choir stuff that's yeah, at the end, the harmony exactly. layers, which were uh, maybe through his... Uh, Divided by 13s, I think that's what he used for an amp. That sounds then. right. Remember, we had him right over here in the corner. And um, I think you played some guitar, too. I remember you playing bass. And I don't remember what's in the final mix, but... Um, yeah, I'm playing lots of guitar. Yeah. Um, uh, and then did we do drumsticks on the floor? We did a bunch of sounds for the little in-between percussion. There's a wooden stool here that sounds amazing. That's it's the Louis Armstrong stool. It's the stool that Louis like a bar Armstrong stool? with that wooden stool. I remember that. That's the sound of the It's that's it sounded so good. And I think we double tracked it and I think maybe I'm playing the floor on one take too, but it's mostly I that seem stool. To remember that. Yeah. Stool sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. I mean, not to just continually blow smoke up your butt, but seriously, like you miking anything is gonna make it sound amazing, but it really like that was a really cool sound, and it, again, it was just we were just flying by the seat of our pants, yes. you know. And then I remember we were kind of done, and Mika said, "Well, we still have time. Like, do you, do you want to do a second song?" And so I said, "Well, that lollipop song yeah. is really fun." So um, we wound up getting into lollipop, and then he extended he extended his stay, and we did a week at my Culver City studio, and we added some extra stuff, and we really got into kind of like little tweaks and mixing stuff and, yeah. and ironically Doug Morris insisted that we use the rough mix with no automation on Grace Kelly he's like you guys have not beat the very first board mix you sent mm -hmm. and that's what became Mika's biggest single oh, yeah. yeah done here yeah the rough mix was here yeah I'm yeah. pretty sure it was off this console yeah. which which has so much magic and but we could we should talk about Greatest Showman, but we could also talk about, speaking of the rough mixes, Lenny Warrinker. Rufus and Wainwright. The Rufus, uh, across the, un across, the, across universe. the universe that we did. I remember saying to Rufus and Lenny, guys, do not get married to this. That's right. I remember that. Like, I can't even hear the string section that we paid all this money for. There's no automation. I have no automation on this Soundcraft console I've got. This is like one of the first sessions ever in my new studio in like 2001, whatever it was. Don't get married. And they're like, oh, we, we we're not going to get married to it. I remember that so well because I remember <laughs> Lenny being there and me putting up the faders, writing the vocal a little bit. Yes, you did. I remember that. You were, yes, you and were then, writing the vocal. Thank God and then you were writing the vocal. I remember turning the monitor pot down while I was printing the rough mix to say hi to Lenny Warrenker and ask how Joey and Anna was and just how Lenny was feeling right. and everything and then go, oh, excuse me, Lenny, I got to fade it and <laughs> faded the end of the thing and went, here, here's your rough mix. And then a couple of days later, we did a final mix and then Lenny calls and says... Well, actually, here's what happens. The Rufus had gone back to Montreal Everything you said is true. And then Rufus started giving me notes over the phone. And I, I felt like, I felt like he, was, he was describing the, the rough mix that I told him not to fall in love with. And, and finally, after like a couple of rounds of notes, I said, are you kind of wishing that we could just use the rough mix? And he's like, yes, I wish we could. And I said, well, you know, we can. Why not? He's like, no, we can't. I said, no, 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 we really, we can. We, you, we can just master, we can master that board mix. And if you don't like it, we don't have to use it. But we can send that to the mastering engineer, Howie Weinberg mastered that, and um, see what you think. He's like, really? That would be such a weight off my shoulders. I said, I know. I kind of felt like you were kind of directing us back toward that thing. And even though it's not perfect and we spent $35,000 on the string section and we can't really hear most of it, maybe it just doesn't matter. Maybe we did, maybe the vibe is right. And Rufus was right. Yeah. And it's uh, it was his most popular track on Apple Music for years and years and years, I think until not that long it's ago. It's a brilliant vocal. It's a brilliant That track. was the first take vocal. Yes. I he know. did two takes and I used for the vocal comp. It's almost entirely the first take, I think, for one or two words I took from the second take. Telly 251, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You recording setting. Rufus yeah. on a rented... That's right. 251 from Design Effects Audio. They had a deadly 251. Yeah. Um, and Rufus showed up ready to go. And I remember the only thing I said to him was, um, don't try to sing this. 
don't try to sing this song. Just let it just let it just come out of you. Don't don't give me a performance. Like just just be chill with it. And and it was ridiculous. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Remember he heard all those harmonies too. He's like, okay, open up a track, open up another track. And we didn't know what he was doing. And then after like eight tracks of it, he had this whole grid, this whole tapestry of stuff in his head. I mean, he's just so beyond yes. the next level. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like working with Carol King, where Carol like hears those harmonies before she puts the melody on. That's it's right. incredible. Yeah. Like she just comes up with, okay, uh, let me have another track, and I'm gonna just, oh, let me just erase this one note here, and I'll put something. Up. Oh, it exists here. You just have it, to get it out. Amazing. Yeah. Incredible like that. You have a whole other part of your career happening now, and that's film soundtracks, the film world. And I'm like so proud of you that you have this going on because you really do think cinematic in the way you make records. So I think it's mm. the perfect venue that, and needless to say, you've just killed with greatest showman alone not to mention all these other film soundtracks but we really should take a moment to talk about that because i've seen you work on these songs and i've seen how intense they are in, in terms of the amount of tracks the amount of layering that goes on and then having to deal with the politics of that and the, the film editor and the director and the producer and the changes to all that. It's, it's intense and immense and I don't know how you deal with it, but it, it, at the very least, I gotta know the secret to the giant stomps <laughs> and that crazy montage that opens up the, the movie that is just so overwhelming. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> so I, well, first of all, I don't think I deal very well with all of the cooks in the kitchen, you know. Who does? Yeah, it's just, I'm not, I, I could be such a better politician than I am. I don't, I'm just not a good liar, you know. I don't know how to, like, if I'm upset about something, I don't know how to hide it. But, <clears throat> but I'm sure you're exactly the same. Like, I feel like people like us do our best work when we don't have somebody going, uh, could you kiss that person again? But this time, like, turn your head a little bit. <laughs> Actually, can you change your shirt? Actually, don't kiss them. Kiss that person and... Kiss them on the ear, not that. Like, shut up. Let me just. You know, I want to do this the way I'm feeling it. Otherwise, exactly. I have nothing. I can't trust my own instincts. So, yeah. um, so, Sh Showman was. It's sort of your fault that I wound up working on Showman because the director Michael Gracie was a big fan of the Mika records, and I get heaps of praise, in particular for how Mika's debut album Life in Cartoon Motion sounds. But you're a massive reason why. My God, the sounds you got, and I've said this so many times. You could just put the faders up. You have this ability to get sounds. I don't know how you do it. Al Schmidt's the only other person I've seen do this, where the sounds that you get are also the sounds you need at the end, at the finish line of a track. And I don't know how you know how to do that because there's so many things that can happen that inform and change what you want the drums to be or do, uh, or any instrument, but in particular the drums. Uh, the low end of the record, like the bass, like what should that be? by the time you put on whatever, a string section, or all the background vocals, or the new piano part that wasn't there before. And somehow there's such, the thread count is so high in your sounds, you know, that it just, it's effortless making, uh, mixing a record that you have also, you know, taken your time to really get the sounds exactly where you want them. So. As you know, I feel very indebted to you, and I really thank you for that. Oh, um, kind. And I've learned so much from watching you do it and listening to you do it. So, uh, so he was a big fan of the Mika records, in particular Life in Cartoon Motion. And then that opening song, which is called, confusingly, The Greatest Show, which opens the movie The Greatest Showman, it felt very... Uh, if he reminded me of like the Def Leppard record, Hysteria. Oh, wow. And I often listen to that like, well, really any Mutt Lang production. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. And I also am consumed with the thought that never in a trillion years could I ever, ever do anything that sounds like a Mutt Lang production. I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. It's just my aesthetics would never, ever let me make those choices. Me too. Yeah, I get it. But when I hear it, I love it. Absolutely. I love it. And I really marvel at it. And 
it's just so what it is and he just he's plugged into an outlet i just can't access but anyway so i tried to really kind of like chase that vibe and the whole the i can't really sing but the oh, those background vocals it's like a big gang vocal and i did the mutt lang like run it through a marshall amp and distort it and i ran it through a whole bunch of different distortion units and blended that in wow. to give it that that teeth it really that, does have that it does actually have like this kind of metal energy for a broadway musical it was total devil horns yeah. it really was you know um uh sonically and then <laughs> and the um the drums i was working to picture which is something i'd never done before showman was the first movie i'd ever worked on and i spent the first week or two going i don't know how to do this i'm intimidated and then once i got over that i realized it actually felt a lot like working on a record but with the music with the video. visual component yeah yeah. Which I really, I, I found it quite helpful, actually. So just watching people stomp, they had all these people in the stands, like, stomping. And, and I just thought, I want this to, like... I kept imagining that I would bought a ticket to go see this movie, and I'm in the theater watching the finished movie. And that's the only thing that got me through it, knowing how, what to do with it. And, you know, when you're listening to a record or watching a movie... Sometimes we'll have critical thoughts of like, oh, I wish they'd done that. Mm -hmm. Or if I was involved, maybe I would have encouraged, I wouldn't have let that happen. I would have suggested this. And then I realized, well, actually, I'm, I'm in a weird position where I can actually affect what the movie is going to be, musically at least. So I really got in there, really, like, really just had fun. And, and after about a month of working on it, the director, Michael Gracie, he, he came to the studio to check in. He'd come like a couple times a week. He really gave me a lot of space. And he turned to me and he said, you're changing the way the visuals look. And I thought that was, I'm so paranoid, I thought that's a bad thing. Like, oh no, I'm th he's like, no, 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 it's good. But he's like, they, it looks different to me now. And he shot, he'd be worked on it for four years. So it was this funny, like, like you were talking about earlier, the collaboration of yes. like, someone's better, input. Better, back, forth, better, better. Yeah, back, kick the ball, kick, 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 exactly. kick, kick, you get higher, higher, yeah. higher. Comedians do that when they're working on stuff, they just spitball ideas. And, right. You just, and everyone immediately recognizes the funniest idea at that moment. That's Keeper, and they just keep doing it. So it's our version of that. Um, the, so the stomps, which we definitely had people from the studio going, that's too much. <laughs> that's bad. It's too much stomp. <laughs> and, and I, you know, goofy little rebel that I am, I'm like it made me want to turn them up even more. And, and it's just so over the top. But to me, it felt right. So it's... It, it's, is it like it's 50 so tracks things. of stomps mixed in with yeah. 10 guitar amp reamped stomps? It's everything. <laughs> it's everything. One of the songwriters, um, uh, Justin Paul, he said a really funny thing to me uh, when I was meeting those guys for the first time and I was trying to sound all like, like I know what I'm doing and I have, I have some wisdom and water under the bridge and I can impart some knowledge here. I said, you know... Um, I said, I, I often find that, you know, less is usually more. And he's like, Greg, I think on this project, you'll find that more is more. <laughs> and I just thought it was so funny. He was so right. Like, wow. we just kept piling, piling, piling stuff on. And that applied, except for the ballads. Uh-huh. And some of the ballads I thought were so beautiful that I didn't even come in as a producer. I yeah. just mixed them. Hmm. I said, I don't need to touch this. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous yeah. Joe Trapanese, this fantastic composer, um, an arranger, he and producer, he he worked on the ballads with those guys, and it was amazing. I didn't want to touch it, but anything with tempo and drums, I, I sorry, I'm sort of losing the plot right now. But uh, the no, but the, but the that track, that sound, those stomps, that's become the sonic signature really for that film i mean obviously great performance beautiful story everything's wonderful but when i really think of th the sound of that movie i think of those stomps so just like you do with a record with creating some great guitar sound or the mika sticks or whatever you've really created a, a sound that now becomes part of the identity of that film that's a wonderful thing and, and that really is part of our job really as as record makers to come up with a character something that identifies it something that makes it special and unique from anything else and i think you really did it with that film that is a really beautiful thing to highlight like it's getting out of the way 
to avail yourself almost to like to the, to the spirit of the intention of the idea that from the get go you know like for me because I did have the the benefit of working to this visual like Michael Gracie's a really great visual he's an ama he's amazing with the camera he's incredible like genius visually uh, he used to work with Michel Gondry oh, uh, wow. he's just he's unbelievable so I saw these people like just smashing these. Um, you know, sitting in the stands of this like circus um, in the round. To me, what you're complimenting me on has nothing to do with me. It was right there in the picture. It was baked but you into took it and the. Blew it up and turned it into something really special. I felt like it was already happening. Hmm. You know what I mean? So I just, I just chased it, and it felt wrong to me that it wasn't sounding as big as it looked. That's all. You know, I, I don't even feel like it was my idea. I just felt like I wanted it to match the <clears throat> the energy that Michael had captured visually. Makes sense. And it's what, what you did with a demo, whether it was 21 Pilots or somebody else, you took what was there and you amplified it to a point that everybody gets it. Everybody can connect to it. That's that's the job. There's a great... I'm a big fan of Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, or me too. Who, who isn't? Me too. And he's just so brilliant, and he has a lot of really thoughtful things that he says about making movies. And he's and there's a great documentary that Vivian Kubrick, I believe that's the name of one of Stanley's kids, filmed on a 16 millimeter camera while they were making The Shining. And Stanley took a long time to make movies, and she would just walk around and like interview Shelley Duvall and Jack Nicholson. It's a lot of footage. So if you buy the DVD of The Shining, there's this little I don't know how long it's like 20 minutes long, yeah. a lot of footage of Jack talking. And Jack Nicholson says. Stanley and I always argue that Jack says, I want to play it naturally. I want to give it like a natural performance. And, and Stanley says, that's great, but for me, that's not what I'm going for. It's a bit boring. I want a heightened, more, I don't think he uses the word comical, but like um, more exaggerated performance. And he said to me, as an actor, Jack Nicholson saying, it feels like it's overcooked. It feels like it's too over the top. But he, he said, Stanley said to me, he said, the way I make movies, it's like, I'm not taking a picture. I'm taking a picture of the picture. Mm -hmm. It's like this sort of heightened like yep. thing that just grabs your collar a bit more in yep. kind of an unnatural way. But it just kind of shows up on the radar a bit more fiercely. And I don't really know what I'm saying. No, you're, I, I get it. Because when you really think of those films, think of the lighting alone. Everything is so hyper exaggerated and you, obviously you would have to have a performance that matches that or exactly. excels uh, it, it's perfect that's just a great analogy my my interpretation of, of that whatever i get from it I, I try to apply when when applicable but i try to inject that into stuff i'm trying to make come through the speakers i love it great thanks for being here on our show this was just such a treat such a great hang Really appreciate it. My pleasure, my honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm.